All right. Well, if you would turn in Mark to chapter 9, we're going to be in verse, we're going to start out in verse 14. The title of the message this morning is The Most Powerful Relationship. The Most Powerful Relationship. All right. This, this teaching, or this uh, recording of an incident, is recorded twice. It's recorded in Mark 9, 14 through 29, and it's also recorded in Matthew uh, 17, uh, verse 14 through 20. We're going to be reading out of uh, Mark, however... Um, I may pull stuff from Matthew as well uh, as we go throughout the teaching. This translation says, When they came together, or when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teacher of the law arguing with and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked, which is Jesus. A man in the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought my son who is possessed by a spirit that has, that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him in, uh, to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Then Jesus' response. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you and how long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. And when the spirit saw Jesus, when the demon in the young boy saw Jesus, sorry, I just lost my place. It immediately threw the boy into a convulsion, and he fell on the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or into water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, Jesus said. Everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. And he calls out, you deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked. It convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, This kind comes out only by prayer and some translations say, and fast, by prayer and fast. Hmm. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you that we have an opportunity to gather together as a family here. Lord, I pray that your word will go forth and it will be received in the manner that you want it to be received in. I thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit who works in and through all of us. I pray that you will reveal your truths to us through your word by your Holy Spirit today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So, I will tell you, it's been a while. God put this teaching on my heart. Well, he started working in me. The way that my teachings come about um, is through God starting to reveal things to me. 
And that's how it should be with all of us. Um, it is all of our jobs to go out and to share Christ with the world. But you pour out from what God is pouring into you. Okay, you pour out of your overflow. So he started really working with me because um, my wife and I were dealing with a situation, a family situation, and, and I started really digging into taking authority over or how to overcome situations in our life, you know, like evil spirits or, or uh, death or pain or suffering or whatever it is. Because God has given us all things to be able to accomplish His purposes, His works, His will. But we have to know His will first, right? We're going to dig into this a little bit. So, it's interesting. The way that this starts out, it says, when they came to the other disciples. So, Jesus had Peter, James, and John with Him. They were somewhere else. And Jesus sent all these other disciples to go out to heal the sick raise the dead, cast out demons, all these things, and they were doing it, and they were very successful. Very successful. But we get to hear about this one time where they're not successful. Have you ever been able to accomplish something in your life, and then other times you go to do the same thing and it doesn't work the same? Maybe you're trying the same way to do it. Is there an echo in here to you guys too? Maybe it's just me. Um, the point is, there's not a formula to it. You can't do the same thing every single time and get the same results. If that were the case, we wouldn't need Jesus. We would just do the formula. You know what I mean? We wouldn't have to seek Him. We wouldn't have to develop this relationship with Him. So um, he goes to them, and he's talking to them, and he says, what are you arguing with them about? He's asking his disciples, what are you arguing with these Pharisees about? At this point, they already knew Jesus and the Pharisees kind of butted heads a little bit. And Jesus is like, have you ever heard me straight up arguing with them? No, I just tell them the truth, and that's that. Well, if you know anything about uh, the disciples, some of them Jesus had to, kind of, had to kind of coach a little bit because it would be like taking me and putting me directly under Jesus' teaching. I don't do things the way Jesus does. You know, I try to, I strive to, but my flesh often gets in the way and I try to bulldoze my way through things. Well, what I'm learning is that the more I get to know Jesus, the more I get to know his heart and his desires, the way that he would do things, it helps me to do things the way that he would do things. And so this, uh, this is so amazing that he shows up and he says, why are you arguing with them? And so then this guy comes out of the crowd and he starts telling them that his son has been demon-possessed. And his disciples couldn't, couldn't handle the problem. They couldn't resolve this situation, this desperately horrible situation. They couldn't do it. They tried all the things that they had seen Jesus do already. They tried the things, I'm sure, that they had already been successful in, yet they couldn't do it. And they're dumbfounded. They're like, we, we tried. We tried doing the things that you told us to do. Well, they waited to ask Jesus about it. Did you notice that it said whenever he went into another room, or went into a room, they come and ask him in private. That's, uh, that should tell us, if you can't accomplish something, don't sit here and make excuses about it. Go ask him, why not? And when he gives you the answer, then do that. He will give you the answer. So, but Jesus' answer here, he says, he, he tells them, he says, this only comes out with prayer and fasting. But Jesus didn't pray and fast over it. Did anybody catch that? He healed it immediately. He cast it out immediately. And what I want to cover today is why was he able to cast it out immediately? What I want to give you today is the answer so that you can take that answer, you can get it deep down inside of you, and then you can reproduce that into the world. It's stuff that I'm working on too, though. 
I promise you throughout this whole thing, I'm not telling you anything that I'm not working on myself, okay? I'm not telling you anything to bring any kind of condemnation or something for the enemy to be able to sit there and whisper lies into your ears. That's not what this is about. It's not at all what this is about. So, what was the, the, the problem here? They asked Jesus, why couldn't we? And he says, because of your lack of faith. Now, there are a lot of different translations that use a lot of different terminology there, um, like no faith, because you're um, just, they get the definition wrong. It's not no faith. It's, it's your lack of faith is the situation here. It's not that they, they don't trust. They've walked with Jesus all this time. They've seen him do all kinds of crazy things. They've seen the waters just boom, hush. They've seen food appear to feed thousands and thousands of people. It's not like they don't have faith. They were just out healing people right before this. They have faith. They have faith. It's not that they don't have faith. Okay, I think that he's speaking here not just to them, but he's saying these things because he knows that these words are going to be written down and they're going to last for all of time. So he's speaking to me here too. This lack of faith. I also, I also believe that there were they were struggling with competing ideas. Competing ideas. I will tell you this. Yesterday, well, I'll preface it. There are so many times where me, Scott, Rod, any of us, whenever we're preparing teachings, we listen to multiple other teachers. Like we don't just, just come here on Sunday and get fed from one another. We listen and we study and we, we listen to all sorts of different faith-based, Bible-believing, spirit-filled teachers. That's what we do. And what we found is in this vein, God, like, He's in this vein all across the country, all across the world, really. And I'm mowing yesterday, and I always listen to teachings or worship while I'm mowing. If I'm listening to worship, Brittany gets to hear me screaming over the, over the sound of the motor because I got, I got my headphones on, you know. I, I don't know how loud I am, but I do know that I don't sing well. I especially don't sing well when I'm wearing headphones and I can't hear anything. You know what I mean? But uh, so anyhow, I'm listening to a teaching yesterday and the pastor started going over this. The same stuff. I mean, I already had my message written and, and it just broke me. I know it, it may sound weird, but it broke me. Like I literally started crying while I'm mowing the lawn. I'm trying to mow the lawn because this, this understanding that God sees me where I am, that I am hearing him, that he's putting me in this vein with all these other, with what he's doing in the world. It just, it wrecked me. I'm like, God, you love me so much. And it just, oh man. I mean, it just absolutely wrecked me. But this, this teacher, he used a, a different um, set of analogies. He was talking about this garden that he and his wife have. And unfortunately, his wife's been sick, and so she hasn't been able to tend their garden. And because of that, a lot of uh, weeds have started growing up. And it's competing with the seeds that they purposefully planted and that they purposefully water. But whenever they water those seeds, it also waters the weeds. And then they have all these weeds because they don't have time to be able to mend this garden. And so the seeds that they plant are competing with all these other seeds. Think about this. These seeds are the thoughts. They're the things that you get taught in school. The things that you get taught in social media or on TV or on the radio. It's all these competing things that's being put into your head and it's competing with the Word of God. And these guys that tried to go cast this out, 
This demon, it wasn't having it at the time. But if we can weed out these different ideas, if we can just focus on the seeds that God plants in us, and we can water those, and we can get rid of these other thoughts and make, make Him the key focus, put Him above everything else. It's the first commandment. This is your God. Keep Him first above everything else. Above everything else. If you're focused on that, then you're not going to be focusing so much on the, these competing ideas. But sometimes, with us being humans, we have a lot of competing ideas, don't we? I mean, just all kinds of junk in our minds. All kinds of junk in our minds. And uh, some of it is intellectual, right? Right? It's like, well, I went to college, you know, and the professor says this, and they're, they're very, very smart. They're intellectual, you know, and maybe, maybe you lean more toward the intellectual side. But guess what? God's smarter than everyone, and he believes in his word. He believes so much that he sent Jesus. He's more intellectual than anybody you could ever possibly know anyone ever in fact he created those people he created the molecules the the um, cells that make up their brain that gives them the ability to retain any kind of thoughts whatsoever he created all of that so people that throw out the intellectual concept well i i don't believe because i lean more toward the intellectual side well I'm sorry, but what you lean toward is a lack of faith and a lack of trust in God. That's what you lean toward, not, not you're, you're too smart to believe in God. That's not the case. Maybe some of the things that, that we struggle with, I know that I struggle with, is busyness. You know, I'm so busy that I have a hard time making the, keeping the main thing the main thing, you know, because... Like Lonnie said, in the middle of prayer, and I got these, these thoughts going on. I don't know about you guys, but God made my mind to where I, I'm constantly creating. I'm constantly thinking about new ideas. I can make this. I could do this. I could do this. I could do this. It's a great thing. I mean, it's great whenever it's contained. If it's not contained, it's not great because I'm like a little bunny rabbit. Can't focus on anything. So there's a lot of things that we compete with, right? But Jesus said that the problem was a lack of faith. A lack of faith. All right, so what is faith? Faith is complete trust or confidence in someone or something. A complete trust or confidence in someone or something. So what he's saying is, you, you didn't have complete trust and complete confidence. What was this demon doing? Even whenever the father of this kid brought him to Jesus, the demon saw him and immediately cast this kid down on the ground and he started foaming at the mouth and he started seizing. If that's what he did with Jesus, don't you think that's probably what he did with the disciples? And if he did that with the disciples, don't you think they probably got distracted and they started to, they started to quiver, they started to kind of shake, and they saw that this thing has some, some sort of power. It, it has more power than maybe other things that they had come in contact with. So maybe it distracted them from the fact that God put the power in them, gave them the authority, gave them the commission, and told them to go cast these things out. But they're seeing it manifest right here in front of them, and they're like, oh, how, am I, how am I supposed to do this? You know, maybe, maybe that got them just a little off course. Have you ever been going toward what God has called you to do, but then you see something that you feel like is just impossible to overcome, so you don't overcome it because you're caught up in the distraction of the moment? You're caught up in how big this problem is, and you forget how big your God is? I have, and they obviously did too. It's not that they didn't have faith. It's that at that moment, 
their problem seemed a little bit bigger than they could handle on their own. Because at that point in time, Satan was, was telling them their, their, their humanness was telling them that this is beyond you. When Jesus said, it's not beyond you. In fact, he said, go cast out demons. And there was a demon in this kid. He told them to, and they didn't. Faith is having complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Now, the word also tells us that faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. It's not that they hadn't heard the word of God. They heard the word of God come out of Jesus' mouth for years at this point. They heard the Word of God. Faith was in them. It was. But there was still something lacking. There was still something lacking. What I love about these guys is when it, when it happened, it's not recorded in Mark or Matthew, so I assume that it didn't happen. They didn't just kind of try to create a theology around why it didn't happen. Do you notice that? But I've done it. I have whenever I've prayed for people and they haven't been healed. I've had to try to reason in my mind, why did this not happen? There must be a good reason for it. I can argue my way out of just about anything. But they didn't reason. They didn't say, well, obviously God wants us to, to uh, maybe just dig deeper into this or maybe, maybe God's utilizing this situation to help push us closer to Him. And whenever we get closer, you know, maybe, you know, and we sit there and we walk down through all these different things in our minds trying to justify why we weren't able to accomplish the thing that God told us to do. They didn't do that. And I love that they didn't do that. I think that that's very dangerous, too, for us to do. I think, I think it's extremely dangerous, especially for someone... In, in my position standing up here trying to justify something to you whenever it's not in the Word. If I'm telling you something that's not in the Word and it's not backed up by the Word, please check me on it. Please, because that's very, very dangerous. It's very dangerous. But one says that they took Jesus aside and the other said that whenever Jesus went into a room, that's whenever they asked Him. They didn't try to create theology about it. They asked him, why not? Why did this not happen? That's what we have to do. If what we're trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish, especially if it's what God has told us to do, it doesn't happen, ask him why not. Ask him why not. He's going to answer you. Like I said a couple weeks ago, we are his sheep. He is the shepherd. If we're his sheep, we hear his voice. We know Him. <clears throat> sometimes, sometimes, and it's backed up in the Word, like John eleven fifteen 15 is talking about um, whenever Jesus is going to go heal Lazarus. And he's, he's not there yet. He's a few days away, or a couple days away, and then He stays a couple more days. But He tells His disciples, they ask Him, or they say, well, well, if he's just sleeping, then no big deal. He needs his rest. He's going to rest. He's going to feel better. No problem. Jesus says, no, he's dead. They're like, why would you say you're sleeping then? You know, that's, that would be my response. Just tell me what it is. You know, my, my head's not, it's not getting through like that. But he tells them why not. He tells them why he's not leaving. And the whole reason is so that you may believe. He's saying this to his disciples. I'm not going right now. He's dead, but I'll take care of it. We're going to go later so that you'll believe. Sometimes Jesus does things. God moves in ways so that we will believe. Not just so that we will believe, though, but so that people around us will believe. The people that hear and see those things will believe. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The Word of God is living and active. It's a two-edged sword. It's living and active, which means that whenever we are stepping out and we are doing what God calls us to do, we are living out the Word of God. 
He's telling us, and you are being the Word of God in this world right now. So think about this. When you do what He's telling you to do, it's building people's faith. Jesus stayed there so that whenever He goes and raises Lazarus from the dead after He's been dead for four stinking days, very stinky, you got, I mean, we won't get into all the finite details, but if you, yeah, thanks, bad. He raises Lazarus from the dead, and they believe. And many more people around believe. If you see some dude get up and come out of a grave after four days being dead, you think you're going to keep that to yourself? I'm not. I promise you I'm not. I'm going to be telling everybody you wouldn't believe what just happened. You wouldn't, but I'm going to tell you what happened. And, and we can go see this dude that was dead. Like you can literally go talk to him. It would be mind-blowing. So much so, you would absolutely have to tell everybody. But he says, so that you will believe. Now, I'm going to kind of be bouncing back and forth here a little bit. So try to bear with me. He says that it, it didn't come out because of your little faith, your lack of faith, your little faith. Like I said, faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And knowing God's will, the way, that you, the way that you get there, the way that you build that faith is by knowing who God is. If you're going to have faith in something, you got to know it. You got to know it. You know, I know that I can have faith in my wife. I know what she's going to do, when she's going to do it, because I know her really, really well. But I'm not stopping where I'm at because I feel like I know her good enough. If the Word says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, but He's living and active, this God that we serve, He's so huge, He's so vast, we could study every single second of every single day and not know everything about Him. Not even remotely close to know everything about Him. So we, as we continue to seek, he will continue to reveal himself to us. New, different, bigger, better, more wild. He doesn't fit in a box. If he fit in your understanding of what God is, then guess what? You could be God, but you can't be because he can't fit into your understanding of what God is. So, knowing God's will you do that by knowing God. You know His will by knowing Him. How do you get to know God? By digging into His Word. By digging into all of the things that He's put right here in front of us. Scott and I have conversations all the time and it just blows my mind how much He's learning, and I'm like, oh, does he learn so much so fast? And then he can sit there and just like repeat it off like that. I'm like, I can't do that. I want to do that. God, help me to be able to do that. But this guy blows my mind with the amount of knowledge that he can absorb. It just, it's amazing. And it's, he's learning about who God is, who God was, who he is, who he wants us to be. And it's, it's edifying. I love it. Thank you. But God tells us in his prayer, if, if you haven't read John 17, it's my absolute favorite chapter in the whole Bible, and I've told you that before. I'm probably going to tell you a million more times because it's Jesus specifically praying to the Father about us, literally about us. There's absolutely no denying it. It's about us. But his disciples, at one point, they ask him, how do we pray? And he lays it out. And I've, I've even done a teaching on that here before. But he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
if you know God's will. You can pray it to be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. Jesus is praying these things. He's praying these things. He's asking the Father that, that we will all be one, just as He is one with the disciples, just as He is one with God. That's His desire. Do you know in heaven that there's no sickness, there's no pain, there's no hurt, there's no sorrow? There's none of these things. And He's telling us to pray, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you see a situation or a, or a circumstance that you know isn't going on in heaven, then you can trust that His will is for it to be as it is in heaven. Now, uh, don't get it twisted. God has a perfect timing for everything. The right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. It just is. But if you hear the Father's voice, if you know what He's saying, if you know what He wants, then you're going to be able to be led by that Spirit. If He says, if you're walking along and He says, pray for this person, boom, you stop and you pray for that person. And no matter what the result that you physically see, that's not what matters. What matters is that you were obedient and you don't know what God is doing through that. With that, you don't know. I was over in Scotland and I saw this lady in a wheelchair and I wanted to pray for her. I was scared to death. And I did pray for her. And guess what? She didn't stand up and walk. I'm like... Nothing. Nothing. But you know what did happen? Her son that was standing there was very upset at me for praying for her. He's like, you people have done this before. Nothing's going to happen. He's standing there just mocking me the whole time. That's not fun. And he's lucky because back then I had a super short temper. And God, I hadn't gotten to where I needed to be in God, but apparently God held me together at that point because he walked away with every one of his teeth still in his head. But the thing is, God loves our obedience. He wants our obedience. He wants it more than sacrifice, even his word says. And I don't know what happened to that lady. I have no idea. But I do know that God told me to pray for her, and I prayed for her. She didn't get up and walk out of that chair at that point in time. I don't know why. But if she's still alive right now, maybe she's walking. If she died and she went to heaven, I know she's walking. You know what I mean? I know it. Something that God has seriously been working on me hard in, hard in, is accepting my authority in Him. Accepting the fact that I am His Son, that I do have the power and the authority to do the things that He did and greater things that Jesus did. And, and I know that 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 sounds crazy, but if we didn't have the Bible to back it up, saying that I'm going to do something greater than Jesus would do would be absolute uh, heresy. But Jesus himself, himself said that I will do greater things than he did here. That means that he has handed over this authority to me, and, and it's my responsibility to walk in that authority. It's your responsibility to take that authority as your own and walk in it. Be obedient, no matter what the results. And, and I used to pray all the time. I, I would start a prayer whenever I was praying for somebody, and I would say, God, if it's your will. And then I started getting this, this like check in my spirit whenever I would say that, and I'm like, what is that? What is that? So then I started praying about it. I'm like, God, what? What is going on here? What are you doing whenever I say, it's, if it's your will? What, like, what can be bad about that? And he says, you know my will. If you know me, you know my will. You don't need to say, if it's my will. It's not my will for people to still suffer with sickness. It's not my will for people to still um, be rolling around in a wheelchair or whatever. You know that it's not my will. However, 
Then I started looking, and, and if, you, if you read the story about when Jesus heals the lame man at the gate beautiful, then you go, wait, well, hold on, God. You said that it's not your will for people to be sick. Well, Jesus, the word says that this man was sat at the gate for something over like 30 years every day. If he sat at the gate beautiful, which is at the temple, if he sat there every day for 30 years, we know that Jesus was a Jewish man and he followed Jewish law, Jew Jewish tradition. That means four times a year he was going to the temple to worship. That means that he walked past this man years, for years, at least four times a year, for years. Even up to the point where he heals him. That means that he walked past a sick man, a lame man, multiple times and didn't heal him. So then I'm like, God, you said it's your will for it to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he said, Nathan, you know my will, but you also know my voice. I have a purpose and plan. So, when it's time for somebody to be healed, I'm going to tell you. When I tell you, pray for them. When you pray for them, they'll be healed. My will is for you to follow my voice, to listen to my voice. Do what I say, when I say, where I say, how I say. Because I'm God and you're not. And I'm like, that's a lot. This is a lot, God. This is hard for me to process. You know, it's hard for me to process. But when it's his will, we have to be obedient. We have to step out in faith and trust that he's gonna do what he says that he's gonna do. I will also tell you that need does not move the hand of God. Obedience moves the hand of God. Need does not move the hand of God. Obedience moves the hand of God. Let that sink in for a minute. I started listening to this, uh, this interview and I'd never listened to this guy before. He's not someone that I would recommend that you listen to on a regular basis by any means. But his name is Joe Rogan and he's kind of a wild child. But he had this lady on and she's from North Korea, born and raised until she was 13, and then was able to get out with her mom, gets over into China. And if, you've, if you think you know about North Korea, and you haven't talked to somebody that lives there, then you don't know about North Korea, I assure you. Brittany and I watched a, a, a documentary of North Korea, and I thought, oh, that's horrible. Then I listened to this, and I thought, that's that's. That's the worst thing I've ever heard. It's, it's just as bad as anything you hear in the Bible. It's just as bad as anything of anybody has ever done to other human beings ever. She gets into China and then she gets sold into sex trafficking. Three different people had to watch horrific things. And then finally some Christians, she was able to contact some Christians, they contacted her and they helped her get into South Korea. More horrible things happened there. And then she finally gets over to America. And more horrible things happened there. I tell you this, I, I do encourage you to go listen to it because it really brings the reality of what's going on in this world right now What's happening today as we speak, as you're listening to me, whether you're here in person or you're online, it's, it's truly happening to people right now. But the thing is, the need 
doesn't move the hand of God. If that were the case, there would be none of this going on in North Korea or in China or in South Korea or in the United States because everything would be this perfect utopia. But that's simply not the case. It's not. But obedience does move the hand of God. We have account after account after account after account. It's proven. It's absolutely undeniable. Our faith and our obedience moves the hand of God. With the anointing of faith that God gives you, because He does give us a measure of faith, we can speak it forth and watch it happen. We can absolutely speak it forth and watch it happen. Now, I will also tell you that Peter was in such a deep relationship with God that as he's walking by, his shadow is hitting people and they're being healed. The handkerchiefs that they were praying over, they're sending out and it's healing people. So you're like, well, that's interesting, Nathan. Because that kind of contradicts what you just said. It does kind of contradict what I just said. It doesn't mean that what I just said isn't truth. Because that is truth. But when Jesus says, and here's, here's the kicker. When Jesus says, this kind only comes out with prayer. And then some translations say fasting. What he's saying here, because he didn't pray and he didn't fast and it happened, is this only comes out when you have a deep, devoted relationship with God. When you are walking in a relationship with God. Prayer is that communication with the Father. It is that where you just, you gain this relationship that you start to understand that I am a child of the Most High God. I walk in His authority. I talk in His authority. Wherever I go, He goes because He's in me. And I know He's in me because I know Him because I'm constantly talking with Him. I'm constantly in communication with Him. We are one. He wants to be one with us just like Jesus is one with the Father. He wants to be one with you. So if you don't want any question about it, then do what Jesus said and go into prayer and fasting. Some people say, well, Nathan, that fasting, it wasn't in the original text. It wasn't in the original text. But so, so that just means that a human being added that later. A human being added that later. So, so maybe it wasn't even God's purpose and plan for that to be in there. Let me tell you something. The Bible is the living and active Word of God. People have tried to cut it out. People have tried to destroy it. People have tried to burn it. People have tried to wipe it off the face of the earth throughout all eternity, and they haven't been able to. Why have they not been able to, you might ask? They haven't been able to because God ordained it to last. Because the God that spoke everything into existence, the stars, the sky, the water, air, blood, cells, the things that He spoke into existence, that God that had it in His mind to create us wants the Bible to last throughout time. And I'm telling you, there's not something that's going to get in here that's going to derail us, that's going to throw us off track, because he's not going to allow it to. Do you think that the God that did all these things would just sit back and let it be twisted? Would just sit back and let it be distorted? Now, people have written all different kinds of translations, and they, they do put some ridiculous stuff in there. But do you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you? You do. I do. And I feel whenever I'm reading something or I'm saying something, like I said... I would even be praying something and God would check me on it. Boop. He will do that with you. Fasting. Adding the word fasting. Does that take away from the text? Does it make it any less? It doesn't. It really doesn't. Because what fasting does 
is fasting is having more of an appetite for the things that you can't see than for the things that you can see. Fasting is, is an, a great part of our relationship with God because you're literally taking your flesh whenever you're desiring something and you're saying no to it. And you're saying, what I desire more is more of God. And I'm going to set this aside for now. I'm going to prove basically to your flesh that, that God, the things of God, this relationship with God, that talking with God is more important than that at that time. Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness before he started his ministry. After that, as far as we know, he didn't fast. And even the Pharisees would be asking him, why aren't your, why aren't your disciples fasting right now? Isn't that interesting? The Pharisees knew that they weren't fasting. They were asking him, why aren't they fasting? And he says, because the bridegroom's right here with them. Why would they need to fast? But then they go to cast out a demon and he says, it only comes out with prayer and fasting. It only comes out with this personal, deep, intimate relationship with God. That's what it takes to accomplish this. Now, after Jesus died and the Holy Spirit came, and He is the helper, He gives them all things. He shows them all things, teaches them all things. Once He shows up on the scene, you don't ever hear about them not getting whatever they ask for again after that. Because anything you ask for in my name will be given to you so that the Father will receive the glory is what Jesus tells him. That's pretty amazing. That's super amazing. If you want more information on fasting, Isaiah 58, the entire chapter of Isaiah 58, is a phenomenal chapter that shows why God wants us to fast, what it does for you. Isaiah 58, check it out. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, When you pray, believe that you will receive. When you pray, believe that you will receive. So, Jesus is telling them, you have to have this deep, intimate relationship with the Father in order to be able to not be distracted by the, the things that are going on right here in front of you. The deeper that relationship is that you have with the Father, the less you're going to be distracted. Look what Jesus did here. The Father brings him up. Brings the, the son up, and right in front of Jesus, as soon as it sees Jesus, he doesn't even say anything, and this thing starts manifesting. What did Jesus do? Whoa, hey. No. He looks at the dad, and just like any doctor would say, how long has this been happening? How long has this been going on? He wasn't moved by, by what this demon was trying to manifest, but the demon just knew that Hey, your boys just tried this. I did this, freaked them out. They couldn't do what they wanted to do. And Jesus is like, whatever. You don't, you don't phase me, son. You know what I mean? Like, it didn't bother him whatsoever. And then he spoke to it directly. He spoke to it directly. He didn't sit there and start praying through this thing. It wasn't some long, drawn-out prayer. He spoke to the situation because of his authority. It had to go. It had to go. Let's go back. He asked, Jesus asked the dad, how long has this been going on? He says, since childhood. Then he goes through and says all the stuff that, that had been happening. And the dad says, if you can. The dad brought him because he knew Jesus' power. He had heard of Jesus' power. But then his, his faith kind of gets derailed a little bit because these dudes that have been living with Jesus, they couldn't do it. I saw him cast out these other people. But So then he's kind of coming with a little bit of doubt. And he says, if you can heal him, please do. And Jesus I, I have no doubt is somewhat humored by this. He says, if you can. Now, there's a couple different takes on the whole if you can. Some people think that that if you can was 
Jesus saying, if you can, because there is a question mark after it. Some people may be taking that like Jesus questioning his question or questioning his statement to say, Jesus, if you can do it. And Jesus is like, what do you mean if I can? Some people are saying that Jesus' response to that of the if you can is how he follows it up. If you can believe, anything is possible for you. I know I can do what I'm going to do. But if you can believe, then anything's possible for you. Nothing's going to hold you back if you can believe. If you believe that this can be done, he's going to be healed, period. It's going to happen. If you believe, it's going to happen. But why? So the Father can get the glory. That's why he says, anything that you ask for in my name will be done for you so that the Father will get the glory. And then Jesus, the dad, the dad says, I do believe, but help my unbelief. I do believe, but there's a part of me that's really struggling to believe right now. Help that part of me. Help that part of me. Who here needs Jesus to help that part of me? I do. I need him to help that part of me. All the time. Because we live in a fallen world, and I'm a human. I need that all the time. That's why he says, daily, Take up your cross and follow after me. Daily, put on the full armor of God so that you can withstand the attacks of the enemy. Daily, you have to do these things. Daily, you have to surrender. Daily, you have to submit. Daily, you have to be in communication with Him in order to walk in the power that He wants you to walk in. It's not every now and then or every Sunday whenever we come to church, we feel like we get filled up enough for the week. You don't. You don't. Because today has enough worries of its own, right? Tomorrow has worries that you have to deal with then. So guess what? Tomorrow you're going to need to get filled back up. That's just the fact of the matter. Me standing up here is not going to do it for you. I promise. I'm sorry. I wish it would. But what I'm hoping is that it will encourage you to get to know Him a little bit more so that you can handle these things through the power of the Holy Spirit that He gives you so that you can walk in the anointing and the authority that He has bestowed on you so that anything that you ask for will be done for you. Then Jesus, when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he sees them all come and he's like, all right, let's just do this. He rebukes the impure spirit by saying, hear this, please, please, please hear this. Jesus is our example of how we should pray for things of how, how we should take up authority over things. This is our example. Jesus says, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. He calls it out, you deaf and mute spirit. Hallelujah. And he commanded, you come out of him and never enter him again. So what happens whenever he takes his authority that God has given him, he takes it and he executes that authority. He speaks it out with absolute knowing, with absolute faith, knowing that it's going to happen. He speaks it out and it says, The Spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. It got, things got worse before they got better. It shrieked, it convulsed the kid violently, and it had to obey the command of Jesus. It had to obey. It didn't have a choice. It wasn't like, no, I'm going to stay. Nope. No, you're not. Because it doesn't have authority over Jesus. Jesus has authority over it. He commanded it to go, and it had to leave. When you command it to go, it has to leave. When you have that deep, intimate, personal relationship with God. That's what he said. Have this deep relationship with me. Seek me out. Know me. And you will walk in the authority that I've given you. And this is the example. Boom, he lays it out. I was talking to my father-in-law about this a while back whenever we were down in Texas. And um, he says, he uses this term, it's called arrow prayers. Arrow prayers. You know a lot about arrows. 
you stick them in, boom, fire them. One shot, that's what you get, you know? Arrow prayers. His arrow prayers are quick, concise, they're to the point. An example of an arrow prayer is, Lord, help us. Or, I need you. Or, peace, be still. Aren't these things quick and to the point, yet they're effective? Jesus in the boat said, peace, be still, and the storm ceased, and the waters instantly calmed. He didn't have to pray about it, this long, drawn-out prayer. He didn't have to fast about it. He commanded it to happen, and it happened, because daily Jesus was getting up and spending time with the Father. He says, I only do what I see the Father doing. I only say what the Father tells me to say. That's Jesus. And that's our example. But these quick prayers, they are beneficial. If you look at the children of Israel, and they're walking around in, in the desert, but even after they're walking around in the desert, and they enter into the promised land, they're, they're on this roller coaster, right? Up and down, up and down. Like, life is good. I don't need God. Life is not good. Now I really need God. And they cry out, it says. They cried out. And he heard them and answered the prayer. He heard them and answered over and over and over and over and over. Even in the midst of horrific, nasty, disgusting, horrible sins. You know, child sacrifice and stuff like that. He still heard them. He still showed mercy on them. An example of this. Modern day example. He was telling me, that he took Brittany and Neil, her brother, uh, and Deborah. They all went to Six Flags in, um, in Texas. And they were, they were standing there in line for the Texas giant. Well, Six Flags has this black asphalt everywhere. Does anybody know that it, get, it gets hotter in Texas than it does here? They were down in uh, San Antonio, I think it was. Is that right, baby? San Antonio? And... The heat is just radiating off of this blacktop, you know, and they're standing in line for hours because, goodness sakes, why wouldn't you? Sounds like so much fun. But they're standing in line for hours and the heat is just baking. And he said they just, he felt like he was about to pass out. And he said, a quick, short arrow prayer. Basically, God give us some relief from this heat or something like God, give us some cloud cover. And he said, these people standing around kind of looked at him like, yeah. And he said, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. And he said, immediately clouds rolled in. He said, within seconds, cloud, like so much so that the people are looking at him and then they go, <laughs> and this cloud cover rolled in and covered them. And then he said they looked at him and they're like, <laughs> just kind of stepping back like, what in the world? But it, it's just, it's walking in that. It's walking in it. It's knowing who you are. It's taking your authority. It's taking your authority. Jesus had the authority to command the wind and the waves. He's given us the authority to command the wind and the waves. And it's by knowing him. Now, I will tell you that demons don't come out by prayer and fasting. They don't. By us fasting, by us missing a meal, doesn't affect the demon at all. Doesn't affect them whatsoever. They just look at us and they're like, whatever, man. It's, it's not the, that's not the point, okay? They come out by your authority. By your authority. And that's only gained in prayer, and in fasting. That's why Jesus said it. You have to take authority. This is how you get authority. They don't come out whenever you're fasting. They come out when you take authority over them and you command them to do what it is that God is commanding them to do. You are speaking it out. You are creating the, the circumstances. You are creating the situation that you want to see come forth as long as it's in line with the Word of God. However, that authority is not only realized because of the relationship, 
you come in through um, that authority. I'm sorry, that authority is only realized when you're coming into that relationship. I can sit here and tell you all day long that you have to take this authority, that you have the authority. I can tell you you have the authority, but you won't recognize it. You won't take it for your own. You won't make it your own until you come into that relationship. Whenever you come into that relationship, it's like this light bulb comes on and you realize the gifts that God has given you, the power that God has given you. Right now, if you only view yourself through your own physical eyes, you're going to see your own physical self. You've got to view yourself through the spiritual eyes that God has given you. You've got to view yourself the way that God sees you, redeemed, restored, renewed, paid for. You were bought with a price, and now you're His. You sit on a throne in heavenly places with Him. You will rule and reign with Him, and that starts right now. When Jesus died on that cross, that door was open to you. And whoever believes has the, the ability to enter in and walk in that authority. The more that you draw in through prayer and fasting, the more that you will understand that, the more that you will take that on your own, and you will start operating in those gifts. I will tell you, complacency does not demonstrate the kingdom. Complacency doesn't demonstrate the kingdom of God. Seeing a situation that needs God to move in it and going, ah, eh, ah, it's not my place to interfere. I'm too busy. I got work to do. Avoiding it, being complacent, being like, ah, it's just the way it is, you know? It's the way the world's going. It stinks. Wish it was different. That does not demonstrate the kingdom of God. And we are put here to demonstrate the kingdom of God. That's why you're here, is to demonstrate that. To show the world God loves them. And that He wants them to be with Him in relationship. Now you may think, well, yeah, but man, you know, it's, I've tried and I've failed. If I stopped praying for people whenever that woman didn't get up out of that chair and walk, a lot of people wouldn't have been healed so far. And lots more won't be healed in the future. But I'm telling you, I'm not gonna stop. I'm gonna keep on because I'm with all of you. I've got the power of God in me and we're gonna rock and roll. We're gonna shake this world up. Yes, yes. Romans 8, 11 says, The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. That same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Did somebody pray for Jesus to be healed? Did somebody command Him to come out of that grave? No human did. But the Holy Spirit did because it says the Spirit that raised him from the dead now lives in you. That spirit, if that doesn't shake you up, if that doesn't get you excited, nothing's going to. It's just not. But the Word says, the same spirit that raised him from the dead lives in you. It dwells in you. It is part of you. And it wants nothing more than to see this world set on fire for God. It wants nothing more than for you to take on your authority, to put it on like a cloak, to put it on like a ring and walk around with it and start showing people God. Start showing people the power of the Most High God. The power of the God that spoke and created. He's wanting you to speak and create. He's wanting you to speak and change your atmosphere, change the things around you. That same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, who is still alive, living right now, today, is, is working in you, is willing and able and wanting to work through you. But you got to command it. 
if Jesus walked up to the tomb of Lazarus and just said, man, he's dead. Yep, he's definitely dead. Wish I had some Vicks to rub under my nose, get rid of some of the smell. But he didn't say, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus wouldn't have come forth. Maybe you haven't seen change because you haven't taken the authority and said, come forth. That's all he's waiting for. If that same spirit is living inside you, it's just waiting to be let out. It's just waiting for you to be obedient and start walking, start talking, start moving. Whenever you see somebody and you get that feeling in your spirit that you need to do something, you need to say something, you need to go put your hand on them, you need to tell them something that's just totally out of there. Out, I mean, just out in left field, you're like, this person's going to think I'm nuts. If you're feeling that, go do it. Go say it. Watch what God does. Speak it into existence. All right. If anybody's here today, and you feel like that, that you're ready to start walking in the authority that God's given you, you just, you feel like you need that little push. You feel like you need somebody to come around you and pray over you for courage, for um, boldness. Then let's pray for you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you don't feel like that you have the Holy Spirit living in you, then let's pray for you. Then accept him into your heart today. It's super simple. There's not a, a, a specific formula for it. It's just real easy. You just ask him, man. That's it. You just ask him. You give him your life. We'll pray for you. I'm going to pray for everybody here today and everybody at the sound of my voice, even online that we will all be walking in more authority, more power, more courage, more boldness, and that we will see mountains moved. We will see people raised from the dead. We will see this world changed, our atmosphere changed. Everywhere that we go, we're going to see changed because we walk in His authority, because we are developing that deeper relationship with Him that He's called us into because He loves us so very much. After I pray, we're going to kick on some worship music. And if you do want prayer, come on up and the elders and I will get around you and pray for you and um, uh, maybe even anoint you with some oil. And if you need to leave, though, feel free to leave. And that's fine. If you have kids in the children's ministry, go pick up your kids. Don't leave them back there and get home and go, seems like I'm missing something. Ah, I've done that, but that story's for another day. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you have given us one another to sharpen each other, to lean on each other, to encourage each other. Thank you, God, that you, have, you are in the process of making us one, just as you are one with Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your Holy Spirit who gives us the power and the authority to walk in your anointing, Lord. Help us, Lord, to draw in closer to you. Help us to have a hunger and a desire to get to know you more, to get to hear your voice more. Help us to be obedient, even in the small things, God, even whenever we feel like nobody's looking, God. Help us to be obedient to you in all things. Lord, we give you the glory and the honor and the praise. I thank you, God, for all the things that you're doing here, the things that you're going to do, the things you're about to do, the things that you have planned for us that we can't even wrap our minds around, God. God, I pray for more anointing over these people. I pray for more anointing over this house, over this church, over this body of believers, Lord. I pray, Lord, that we will have a a hunger and a thirst for you like never before. I pray that you will stoke the fire inside us, God, that just has to get out. I pray for more anointing, more anointing through your Holy Spirit. More anointing through your Holy Spirit. Spirit, move in us. Rest on us, God. 
Help us to walk in what you see. Help us to walk in your authority. God, help us to realize that that authority is ours for the taking, God. And all we have to do is act on it. God, we love you. Oh, we love you, God. God, we ask for more of you, but we also surrender all of us to you. We surrender ourselves completely and wholly to you, God. Completely and wholly to you, God. We are yours. We are your vessels to do with what you wish, Lord. Break down every fiber of ourselves. Break down every fiber of our selfishness. And God, I ask that it will be removed far from us. That it will not come back. God, help us to set ourselves aside and you to shine through. Shine through, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name, the name of Yeshua, the name above every other name. We pray these things, God. Amen.